are you, Alice? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. Oh, I feel so far away from you today. I know, it's really sad. We're usually on the same side of the table, but we're on opposite sides of the table today. Um, you'll find out why in a second. And I feel really, like, distant. I can't look at you, I the know. mic's in my way. All I can see is our new, our new fluffy microphone thing. Yeah. What's it called? <laughs> I don't actually know. I think it's called it's called a pop filter, I think. Ah. But usual the classical pop filters they're like a little ring that they hold in front of the mic. But um because we're recording from both ends and I don't want to buy two, I just bought this sock thing that goes on top of it. Yeah. To be honest, I think I could have put a sock on the mic and have done the exact <laughs> same thing. <laughs> so if you're wondering why we sound completely different, it's because of our new sock. Hopefully it sounds better. Yeah. Yeah. It's meant to cut out all the harsh P's and K noises and stuff. The P's and K's? Yeah. Were they the harshest sounds that you can think of? No, that's gen- no, genuinely. That's what it's like written in the description as it's going to cut out all the harsh P's and K's. That's what pop filters are for. They cut Because P's and, and K's <laughs> sound really harsh. Like, um, I think audio recording equipment picks it up in a certain way that it can sound really harsh. Interesting. Yeah, and my guest next to me, I feel like, is dying to make some comments <laughs> right now. <laughs> Um, I have something to address from the last episode. Do you, Kiri? Yes, I really? do. As always, I think we should start. I think we need a segment. We need a jingle for like Kiri's rant corner yeah. or something. I don't even need to ask you how you are anymore because you just you just, just it. You don't even need to be asked. Although actually, this isn't a rant. It's more of a maybe a little bit of an apology. So. Oh no. I noticed when I was editing, and then <laughs> someone also noticed when they listened back that I displayed an implicit gender bias against structural engineers so the bit where we're talking about the Sainsbury's car park and I said and I said oh the structural engineer did a terrible job I called it I said this guy um Mm. so when I was editing back I realized that I'd gender biased I'd potentially gender biased the structural engineer as a man and my friend also commented on it when she realized she messaged me saying it's interesting that you said this guy when you're talking about the structural engineer and then Demelza also said, it's interesting that I thought that considering our guest who was a structural engineer was a woman. Anyway, oh, shit. I was thinking about it. And first of all, I realised that my, gen- my gender bias wasn't towards the fact that he was a structural engineer. It was towards the fact that they did a terrible job. So, oh. there we go. So apologies to all you male <laughs> structural engineers out there for being implied to be bit shit. Yeah. Actually, no apologies. I take it back. So what was that whole part just about? I was apologising for potentially doing a gender bias, but I realised I wasn't. I'm going to cut this bit out, because now we're just talking about shit. You are going to cut it out. I'm going to cut it out. going to cut it out. (laughs) Apologies if this week's episode makes no sense, because it's my first week editing. Probably cut this out too, but you know, if anyone's interested. Also, um, just a quick update. So two episodes ago, we did our little rant uh, about the science, about how you shouldn't do science communication over Instagram. Um, that was published in Science, yeah, and targeting was, some specific people. Uh, yeah, it was targeting Science Sam um, and just general female Instagrammers. Science have published another article written by another group of communicators. One of the authors is Science Sam. Oh shit, I didn't realise that. Yeah, um, basically se- arguing against it and they raised very similar points to what we did. Which I think was probably a general opinion among scientists. Yeah, exactly. Was that the arguments were weak, yeah. to say the least. Anyway, you should go read it. I'm sure Silent Demelza would be so kind to post a link on the blog. I just think it's hilarious that the same journal that posted that first one in the first place then posted the exact... Retraction. Al- almost exactly two weeks later, an article saying that article was shit. Perfectly timed for our podcast. <laughs> it's like, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, science. <laughs> it's kind of reminiscent of how The Sun has to apologise for something they've written about like every week. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. Except in science. See, we can be interesting too and scandalous. <laughs> so. Yes. Are we going to introduce our guest or do yeah. you have more to talk about? I don't have anything else. Reese, hello. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for having me. God, your voice is going to sound great on this. Yeah, Kerry was really excited. She texted me during the week and she was like, the accents are going to be all over the place this week. Yeah, we have, yeah. Like, it's going to be you some know. good diversity. Of yeah. Yeah, 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 very diverse. We have Irish, Scottish, Scottish. London, and, and then some sort of North. north. <laughs> <laughs> Although, not, apparently not North. We'll find out. We'll find yeah, out. Yeah, we're not really then. sure. Yeah. So we'll we, ask him later. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a bit about yourself. What do you do? Okay, so I work in tech. Uh, I'm a product manager in a tech company called Rate Setter. It is not my background at all uh, in terms of tech. I've managed to stumble my way into tech. However, I ended up studying earth science at university. So I did an undergrad in earth science. Yeah. So we have another layman who <laughs> is a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> 
Just for all you listeners out there, we're running out of non-science friends. <laughs> if anyone wants to come on our podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to find some more last night's friends. It's hard. It is quite hard. Yeah, yeah I don't think I'll know much about it today, though. I, I know rocks. It's, yeah. <laughs> I, I know things about rocks. Oh, oh. Rocks so, are great. What's your rocks. opinion on crystals? Yeah. Right, so I watched this video recently, a YouTube video from a YouTuber that I actually really like, and it was about her crystal collection. So she has like rose quartz and oh, clay. They, this is that thing about how they like balance your life. Yeah. So she was talking about all like the energy in the crystals, and she's like, sometimes I like to touch this one when I need to clear my mind. I keep this one by my desk because it channels this creative energy and blah blah. And some stones you don't want to touch because they can take a negative energy, or you need to cleanse them regularly so that you can cleanse all the negative energy that it's taken in. And then she was saying like, I don't let my guests touch this rock because it does absorb any negative energy, and you don't know what energy that person's feeling. And I was sitting there like, what the fuck are you talking about? This is the biggest load of shit I've ever heard. Yeah, I, I did the whole module on energy. <laughs> <laughs> the flow of energy yeah. through rocks. Kind of somehow skipped that in the syllabus. It was so culty. Oh, it's God. just so culty and hippie. And she's just, she's really relying on these rocks to, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's kind of nice to put faith in in, in something. But well, oh. you're just giving control of your life to an inanimate object to a fucking stone <laughs> to know an array of stones actually either just seven like, of them they're really pretty they're really nice to look at but it's not going to give me any fucking positive energy I'm not going to be bored for ideas one day and I stare at a bloody rose quartz and I'm like oh ding I you know. don't stare at it you should like stroke it oh okay yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll just put it next to my bedside table caress it <laughs> caress the rose quartz um yeah so okay would you consider yourself a scientist um I have a science education, but I wouldn't uh-huh. class myself as a scientist. Okay, cool. So I, I'm, I'm quite far away from that now. I did a master's in something fairly similar, uh, but I then pretty quickly went into tech and, okay, I kind of touch in computer science and mm-hmm. other things like that, but no, not not sort of pure science anywhere near anymore. When okay. I when when I first well actually when we both first met Reese he had one of the coolest job titles <laughs> I'd ever heard. Yeah, so so okay, so the first job that I had, so my master's was in I specialized from earth science into natural hazard modeling. So that's what it sounds like. It sounds like earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, all of these things doing probabilistic modeling to actually figure out the risk of these things and then I actually joined a software company a tech company that did this they basically created probabilistic models that allowed you to calculate the probability of something happening and we had lots of people that used our models um now so were you predicting earthquakes so it's not prediction because it's oh. probabilistic so you so, were probabilizing earthquakes <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you want to make up that term go for it yeah um so so those models the kind of grandiose title for those models were called catastrophe models oh unreal. so so uh so yeah my job title was catastrophe consultant oh, amazing yeah. so that's by far the coolest job title ever yeah that's yeah. pretty funny yeah though. it makes you sound really in my five yeah <laughs> like, oh god that's just so cool yeah and what's now your job title now uh, it sounds not as cool. It's a cooler job, but it sounds not as cool. It's just product manager. Boo. God. You should go back to being a catastrophe consultant. Yeah. I know. Or talk to your current employers and see if they can um, <laughs> if they can par your uh, previous job title. So yeah, you're, exactly. you're ha- you have some job dissatisfaction <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> based on your title. <laughs> um, Demalza, Silent Demalza gave herself a snazzy job title. Oh. Because every time people ask her what she does on the podcast, she's never not sure what to say. I um, like to refer to her as producer Demalza, but she doesn't too. like that. So I think it was executive quality consultant kind of snazzy i think it's better than fact checker <laughs> probably better than fact checker yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um if you've listened to a few of our episodes reese has actually made an appearance on the podcast before he has in the form of an anecdote about some weird ass little kid <laughs> who used to lick batteries <laughs> who apparently has a kindred spirit to many other uh <laughs> weird ass kids out there we love you all though <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd so occupy ourselves somehow in childhood in Scotland give us the give us the description you gave earlier on about the specific batteries that were your like favourite yeah it's the, uh, I forget what they are they're like one and a half volt or three volt or something like that the, the little the little like cube ones that have so, the two ports on the top so okay. that you can get your tongue on them oh nice yeah yeah firm. oh yeah. nice yeah, <laughs> yeah. more so yeah, yeah for, exactly for the exactly. reaction so yeah, so then it kind of feels like it's kind of all metallic and like your brain's getting a bit Still fucking fried. weird, man. 
it was great times. Great times as a kid. But I mean, then he became a catastrophe consultant. He did. So Maybe yeah. Yeah. the lightning started on your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I don't get offended easily but I think I was pretty offended when you then looked at me as if of course I don't know, like, of all people to lick batteries it's got to be me I feel like we had similar childhoods <laughs> apparently not Hey always refers to us as twins because we have really similar tastes in everything yep. so just to give context Heya is our friend and colleague and Reese is Heya's boyfriend and we are hoping that Heya will be coming on the yeah. show in a short time in a few weeks She'll, yeah. she has her PhD viva soon and then she'll be on after that Woo, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so Reese and I have really similar tastes and stuff. And it's just, it's like, random experiences that we have are the same. Like, we always, we cried to the same movies that no one else cries to. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hong Kong. No, Hong Kong. <laughs> King Kong. So King, I'm Kong. King Kong. Yeah. Which one? The newer one. Yeah, I was in hysterics after King Kong when yeah. they killed him. Oh, spoiler it's... alert, sorry. If anyone who's not seen Hong Kong is going to be dead. King Kong! <laughs> 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 sorry, I've started something here. <laughs> You really have. And actually, I had Hong Kong on the brain because I got an email today from somebody who's having a conference in Hong Kong. Oh, are you going to go? No. It's one of those spam ones. I never know if they're legit. Uh, you know, it's like a global something or other. And they're like, come join our conference. We have like two speakers. We can't release the agenda because we don't have enough speakers. But please come. I'd love to go to Hong Kong, but yeah. Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> You tried. You were, you were, it was like almost there. King Kong has been remade so many times now. If you don't know the story, then. Most Although people, people always say this to me about things like Game of Thrones and Walking Dead. I caught up really late and I really avoid spoilers. And then I get pissed off when people tell me spoilers. And then they're like shout at me being like, Kiri, that came out 10 years ago. Blah, 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 blah. You shouldn't be surprised if you get a spoiler. And I'm like, yeah, I've gone 10 years having no spoilers. But that's because you were probably did have spoilers in those ten years, but you they weren't on your radar. No. No, I I disagree. No, things like Game of Thrones, you cannot. They are everywhere. Even if you don't care about Game of Thrones, people knew spoilers yeah, from Game of Thrones. Like and I didn't know anything media. until I was at work and people ruined some very big things for me. But do you not think it was everywhere? But you were seeing it. No, I but just, you just no. Weren't taking it I in. would avoid it because I knew one day I'd watch it. Okay. Subconsciously. Interesting. I didn't make an effort to. It just happened. And now I'm catching up on Grey's Anatomy and I know something really big happens and I'm really sad about it. Did you finish The Walking Dead? Uh, no, I've got one more season. I've got... I'm on season... What's the season where Negan comes in? Season 7? Yeah. I'm on season 7. Sexy Negan. Oh, no. No, because... Hang on, did the really awful thing happen yet? No. I know what it is, but no. Oh, okay. I know... Oh, I know. who told you? Uh, Last my, time I talked, you didn't know. My sister accidentally told me. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, I thought it had already happened. Oh. And then she, the way she reacted, I realised that wasn't it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry to anyone that doesn't watch Walking Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and your job takes you to some interesting places, doesn't it, Reese? Um... I've been around. What are, what are you? What are you? I'm what are you specifically referring to um, a little work trip that you had very recently. Oh right, yeah, um, I, was, I was in Ukraine. <laughs> that was that was interesting. Yeah, big business city. Yeah, like, huge, huge in, yeah. business. Yeah, no, I was in Ukraine. I've got developers out there. That's where uh, all my my programmers, not all of them, but some of my programmers are. So I was out there okay. visiting them. You know. Wonderful, and they were showing you all the local delights. And... Yeah, all their wide vast array of horribly flavoured vodkas. Vodkas that you wouldn't even expect to be flavoured. Things like horseradish vodka and soup vodka. Oh, and, soup yes. vodka. Yes, soup vodka. Well, any Specific particular soup or... Borscht. Oh, oh borscht, so which is... Thing is, I can, European, yeah, I can actually imagine a borscht vodka being quite nice. But I kind of imagine it to be... Because if you warm up vodka, you can't really taste the vodka -iness. So then I just imagine it to be like, if you warmed it up, like you would warm sake. Then it's just like drinking some borscht with alcohol. <laughs> yeah, they didn't warm it up. <laughs> <laughs> it was cold. Was there bits floating in it? <laughs> yeah, it was kind of bitty. Like, <laughs> I kind of want to try it though. Yeah, that's because you're weird though. <laughs> we have another guest. I'm sure he's going to give him a warm, warm welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that bad. This is our most opinionated listener. Who has been there from the beginning. He yeah. actually helped someone, us do our first sound test. Who, okay, let's just introduce him first. This is Rob. Hello. Rob, welcome, Rob. Thank you. Rob is Silent Demaz's boyfriend and the harshest critic of the show. <laughs> 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 Nick, 
literally every week <laughs> after the episode comes out and Rob has listened to it, Jamalza will come into work and she has a list <laughs> of comments that Rob had about the show. <laughs> I feel like I've been stitched up here though because it's not like I just come in and I start sit Jamalza on the couch and just start <laughs> lecturing her about how she should do things better. She like asks me what I think and I go, yeah, it's really good. And then she's like, oh, okay, but like, what, really, what do you think? And I was like, no, I thought it was really good. She's like, anything you do differently? And I was like, well, <laughs> if I had to say one thing, I'd say this. And then I'm, I'm assuming she comes into work and she goes, Rob said this without any like, context. <laughs> so I feel like I'm being... I'm Unfairly being, victimized. Yeah, exactly. But I am aware that I am quite critical. But it's only because I care. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> to be fair, is he the first person that we know of that actually has listened to every episode that we know? I'm a subscriber. No, other people have. But are we sure that they Dan have? has. But they're both boyfriends of the show. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> they have to listen to <laughs> There's no other choice. <laughs> well, I, th- I just want it to be the best it can be. So, do you know, do you know what? Oh, I, think, wrong. I think the hurt started before the comments of the podcast. Oh, really? Because the second time I met Rob, he had no idea who the fuck I was. <laughs> well, I was handing out name tags and Kerry came up and I thought... I recognise this person but I'm not really sure where and then she, I asked what's your name she goes Kiri and I went oh someone in Tamales' lab's called Kiri gave <laughs> 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 over the name tab but it just didn't click they were the same people so yeah I apologise for that wait did you say out loud someone in Tamales' lab is called no. Kiri no I just thought it to myself and then you thought it to yourself while I was looking down at the name tags and being but very unfriendly I was so uh, it was so hectic that morning so much had gone wrong That's I won't funny. go into so it you were having now. a stressful day very stressful that was a stressful day I'd, I only did it so I could write the quiz at the end <laughs> it was a good quiz <laughs> yeah. mm. I know. Had lots of comments about our pub quiz too, didn't you? Demelza and I organised a pub quiz at work recently and... Uh, I just answered the questions. With a lot of opinions to go with them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I did. did we, what did I say? I clearly just have opinions about realising. What are your arguments like? Because you're both very opinionated people. We don't really argue that much, to be honest. We argue about very mundane things. What did we argue about last time? She can't she talk. Can't, she can't can't talk. Oh, this is brilliant. I should so take you, all the opportunities. You can say whatever you want and she yeah. can't refute it. I think we rarely argue. I think we get our arguments out with other people. So when we come home, we don't have to argue about anything. Is that why you like to wind up Kerry? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like I'm winding up Kerry vicariously through Demelza. Yeah. So it's yeah. not. I don't but get. The, I don't get the, the the reward of seeing yeah. the wind up. So maybe I'll go. Yeah. Demelza gets the reward. <laughs> no, do you know what it is as well though? But the thing is, so it's one um, when you emailed Demelza random, be saying, "Oh guys, you should have a, you should do this sort of episode and this sort of episode, and you should talk about this paper." And then I was like, I said to Demelza, I was like, "I bet Rob just really well, that's wants a gross to come on the exaggeration podcast. of what happens." I'll tell you all the exact story of what happened. It was, I was quite, it's quite sad and reflects badly on me, so I'm sure you'll like it. <laughs> I, like, I was bored at work. So the paper that I'm going to go through today is one I had to critically evaluate for a piece of coursework. And it's the highest mark I've ever gotten a piece of coursework. Oh. Oh. What was it? 95%. Jesus! <gasps> I didn't think those kind of marks existed. Right? Ne- fucking hell. Neither did I until I got it. What happened to the crap. other 5%? I'm not sure where I lost it. I was pissed off about that. But anyway, um, <laughs> so I was bored at work and I was like, I'm going to read that piece of coursework I did again to give myself a little self-esteem boost. <laughs> I'm just going to read my head. Yeah. Right I was like, oh, you are a good writer, Rob. Well done. <laughs> but then, um, yeah, I was reading it and I was like, oh, this this would work well on Dee's podcast. Didn't you say we should have a dinosaur special? Well, no, then Dee DM me back and she was like, Kiri says you could come on the podcast. And I was like, oh, yeah. But then only if I can do... A dinosaur. <laughs> what, so, the coursework I got my second highest mark out of it was a, um, a, a course I did at uni called Evolution in Deep Time. I wrote an essay called How Dinosaurs Got So Big. <laughs> and it's my favourite. Wait, you were in uni when you wrote this? Yeah. At what age? Like, <laughs> What well, were you in your final? Like 21? 22? <laughs> it's my favourite. Like my brother wrote a similar piece when he was 12. <laughs> I feel like you have a uh, you have a folder on your computer that's like my sad day folder. Yeah. It's got all your best marks. So I'm so up. annoyed. So I swapped. I got a new laptop when I started my PhD and I forgot to transfer that file. Over. So oh I no. Oh God. But yeah, the, reason I, the reason I like that that essay is because I sent it to my brother to proofread and me and my brother are very competitive and we never really give each other compliments and he just sent it back and he went 
Yeah, so I like that. <laughs> oh, oh, that's really cute. Yeah. If you get the chance, we should do an episode on it. It's so okay, good. Fine. <laughs> it's fine. Well, because of our uh, need to recycle guests, that probably will be sooner yeah. rather than later. <laughs> so I dispute I have a northern accent. I think. Well, that's the from... thing is, I thought you sounded really northern. I think Kerry then... falls into the camp of southern. Anyone, you think anyone anything above, above the Thames is. Yeah north and anyone above london is north so then i asked demalza and demalza couldn't really define where your accent was from she said to, your family's from wales no well rob's s- from wales You're, you are kind rob. of so i have a <laughs> bit i have a massive rob, you explain. i have a massive mismatch so mum's from sussex dad's from essex but then they both moved up to chester which is near oh, north wales and then, yeah no demalza did say chester and i said oh wait yeah he does have a really chestery accent yeah so yeah you do i grew up in a village <laughs> Alice, you know what Chester is? I if I gave you a map right now. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's not. Yeah, I grew up in a village equidistant between Chester and Wrexham. Right. Which is a town in North Wales. But my house is about that far in Wales because of How that. far is that? This isn't a video call. Oh, sorry, yeah. For the <laughs> listeners, I place my hands about 30 mm. centimetres apart from one another. <laughs> so, yeah, right on the Wales... Wales Ch- England border, uh-huh. but um, that meant I had to go to a Welsh school, so I did a lot of Welsh. Oh, so and can I had you a lot speak of Welsh, Welsh friends? Very poorly, not what I would call fluent. I've been to Wales before, for like five minutes in my car. <laughs> <laughs> but when we were counting the countries we would we had been to, you weren't allowed. To I wasn't Wales. allowed. So actually, you can't say you've been. Yeah, there. I was driving back. You didn't even realise you were in Wales until you were leaving it. Yeah, no, I was driving back home from Somerset back to London. And um, one of the roads, one of the motorways goes through the border, like through the edge of Wales. So it goes slightly into Wales and then back out. And as I was leaving, it was like, you are leaving Wales. And I was like, oh shit, I was in Wales. This is so cool. Um, so yeah, but like, I essentially feel very under pressure to perform now because of all the... Uh, criticism. The, the criti- the I'm gonna be, constructive yeah. criticism, I would I'm going to be well harsh on your shit, although you probably know a lot more than me, so I probably won't. See, that's the good thing for me. I just need to be dumb. Yeah, just, I just need to that's all you need to do. You have the easiest job here, yeah. really. Yeah, it really did motivate me to prepare today. So I've been spent. I've spent literally all day like <gasps> taking Aww. notes on this. We have such dedicated guests oh, no. taking notes, preparing. I heard your biggest complaint though was about my knowledge of electro- electrophysiology. <laughs> That literally wasn't my biggest complaint. <laughs> Where are you getting the deer's giving you such false information? No, no, that's an interesting point because what what, what was your biggest complaint in your opinion? Oof. It's all right, go for it. Oh, we're so, in. Right, so many to pick from. Do you, want to, do you want to take your list out? I don't, I've never written them down. I don't know. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah. Um, are they not in a file on your computer beside them? No. <laughs> when I'm sad file? No. I, my biggest complaint is you don't have a general intro. Which I think we need. Oh, we're, we're working on it. Yeah. We're working on so we're it. Topic. Yeah. We're trying to come up with a tagline. Yeah, we'll sort something. If anyone has any ideas, do tell us. Someday soon. Yeah. Should so, we talk some science? Yeah. Well, will we ask Rob where his background is. Yeah. No. I bet you were one of those really annoying nerdy kids at school that like knew everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. So I, I had a really good biology teacher. I think that's what got me into bi- into science. Mm-hmm. And then from there, just did biology, chemistry, maths at A level, and then went could never decide which one I liked the best. So I went and did natural sciences at uni, which I think is the story of most natural sciences students. That's where I met Demelza. Cute. Do you want to hear that story? She told me not to tell it on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you're definitely telling it. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I met Demelza in Freshers Week on our on the natural science like first social sexy exactly and because um <laughs> love is in the air because it's natural science the theme was come dressed as anything beginning with n or s okay um interesting so about 80 percent of the girls came as school girls oh lame. it's the most unimaginative thing i've ever <laughs> seen did demalza come as a school girl yeah. lame oh, i expect more from you Sarah demalza i think the phrase is a, a basic bitch am i using that correctly <laughs> And then I I come as a. Sp- How old are you? Seventy. Oh, what's that word those young kids use these days? <laughs> I'm not up with the lingo. My friend Emma, who I'm who I've told to actually listen to this podcast when it comes out, were uh, taught me that phrase last weekend. Oh my god! Oh, last weekend, <laughs> Rob. Why did you even admit that? So yeah, so I'd gone with my friend Marcus dressed as a Smurf. Both of us were Smurfs. Nice. Hmm. Fairly original. We turned up introducing ourselves to each other and back then I was a bit of a knob so I was like back then yeah (laughs) 
And uh, Demelza introduced me to her, to her. I asked her what her name was, and she said Demelza, which, as I'm sure you all know, is quite an unusual name. Mm-hmm. And I was a bit drunk at the time, so it didn't really stick in my mind what her name was. Mm-hmm. So I spent the entire day uh, night calling her Esmeralda. <laughs> no matter how many times she yeah. corrected me, I was just Wait, like... Wait, <laughs> sorry, can I put in? So, this week... This, yeah. Where were we? We were at Reese's yeah, place yeah. with Kaya, and we were talking we about... We haven't actually even told Demelza this yet, have yeah. we? No. No. So we were talking about the podcast, um, yeah. and we were like, oh yeah, the two of us and Demelza. I kept mentioning Demelza and the three of us and how that's his house we were going to, etc., etc. Then we just started talking about the name Demelza. Yeah, because Reese and, and, we all... and Haya had never heard the name Demelza before. Uh-huh. Oh, never. Yeah. And then, so then we just started, like, you know, having a little discussion about Demelza's name, and then ended up Googling where her name came from. And yeah. I was in the camp of, it's not Cornish. Everyone else said it was Cornish, and I was wrong, because it is Definitely Cornish. Definitely Cornish. And hang on, I even figured, it said what it meant. It was, like, something about sweetness. So, yeah, and something about something, a fort on a mountain or something. Fort on a mountain, but yeah. then it said that... Yeah, you could translate it further into sweetness Yeah, because Melza like meant honey or sweet. Yeah. Which is, like, isn't miel, honey, and miel... In French, I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, and the, but then also, you thought we were saying Esmeralda, right? Or you said you you'd heard of the name Esmeralda, but yeah, not just Demelza. never Demelza. Mm. Yeah. So is Esmeralda Cornish also? I don't think so. No, it sounds like a Disney character. Fact check that now. It is a Disney character. It is from the Hunchback. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's from yeah. it's from Disney. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, continue. Um. So yeah, like I'd seen her, I thought she, she looks alright. I'll just try and talk to her, but then I f- assumed I'd ruin my chances. She looks alright, yeah. Mm-hmm. By um, <laughs> calling her Esmeralda the entire night. So when I woke up in the morning, I was like, oh, that was that was a silly thing. To what do. did you wake up on your own? Yeah, yeah, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but no, up, wait, Kerry. I went to check uh, my Facebook account as uh-huh. people did back in 2010. Uh-huh. They still do. <laughs> I still do, obviously, because I've, I've only just... <laughs> don't know what those kids do pictures. these days. Yeah. And uh, I got a message off her Ooh. saying, I really liked your dancing last night. <gasps> and I'm, made I'm, the first move. I'm oh, fully wait. aware of how... Well, yeah, that's Did what she said. Did you get says. freaked? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm fully aware of how bad my dancing is. So I was like, she didn't like my dancing. I, know. <laughs> I knew I knew what was going on there. Oh, very sharp. Yeah, I know. And then from then, <laughs> it just went. And now, what we... Nearly eight years in. Cute. That's a lovely story. It is. Yeah. So yeah, um, so, so yeah, I did natural science at uni, and then me and Demelza were both doing a course where you went on placement for a year. Mm-hmm. So I went to America to do a placement, and then came back and did a master's year at Bath. In the meantime, Dee left to come to London to do a PhD, and I decided to follow her and did the exact same course as Dee, where I'm now doing my PhD. Nice. Yeah. Lovely. Welcome. Hmm. And what is your PhD? Well, I think the official title is Biomedical and Translational Science. I basically work on autism. Quickly, before Rob tells us about his PhD now, so we're gonna, before we get into some science, uh, this episode's a little bit different from the other ones, and it's just going to be Rob talking about his work and then he's brought on a paper um we thought it'd be nice seeing as we bring on a science guest to focus the episode on that guest rather than having me and alice <laughs> <laughs> talk about poo and brain shit. cells yeah. all the time yeah i thought maybe so you might get a taster of something slightly different yeah um so yeah in a nutshell i would say i, I work on autism mm-hmm. but in general the lab i work in focuses on the impact of epigenetics upon brain development. <laughs> Sorry, my drink is very fizzy. For some um, Effervescing. Yeah. So I know. I think I've used my first jargon term there in epigenetics. Uh-huh. So I don't know if I. Yes, do I have to defer to Reese? That first question. To yeah. Explain <laughs> epigenetics. Yeah. yeah. So epigenetics, I think, is a term that's starting to filter through to public consciousness, but I don't think it's quite ingrained yet. Um, it's on the way. It's on the way. So essentially, it's an umbrella term that refers to any thing that affects the expression of your genes that doesn't actually change the DNA. So, again, going a bit further back, your genes are made up of DNA, and if you get mutations in your DNA, that can change the expression of your genes. And lead to diseases. And lead to, lead to diseases. Mm-hmm. Lead, like, sometimes lead to nothing. Sometimes lead to nothing. Depends what the mutation is. But epigenetics is a bit different. So epigenetics changes the things that uh, cause your genes to be expressed. 
and in that way alter how much they're expressed. It's quite a hard thing to get your head around. Uh, but I work on a specific type of epigenetics called chromatin remodeling. <laughs> so, and again, more buzzwords. <laughs> so chromatin. Full of buzzwords. Again. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the way I like to picture this uh, chromatin remodeling. So if you imagine every cell in your body has about two meters of DNA in it. One long stretch. Well, not one long stretch, but long stretch. How many of- cells do we have in our whole body? Trillions. I believe, oh, okay. mm-hmm. and each one of them has two meters, two meters, two meters of DNA. If you, you could... stretched it all out and flattened it all out, yeah, as a double strand. As a double strand. Ooh. I remember something, something coming up about how if you linked all the DNA that you have, so like took it out of every single cell, it would like wrap around the world, like maybe a certain number of times. Oh really? Yeah, <laughs> probably more than this. <laughs> yeah, more than once, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine that's quite a lot of material to fit into inside a tiny little cell. Mm-hmm. The approach your cells take to doing this is they wrap your DNA around things, proteins called histones. Mm-hmm. So you, if you could, the way I picture it is imagine cotton thread wrapping around a bobbin. Mm-hmm. So the thread is your DNA and the bobbin is the the, the histone. Okay. And Translation of bobbin. So we're literally just talking about it going round like... A spool of nothing, thread. Nothing special, just round and round. It's the middle bit of string. Like, if you get a reel yeah. of string, it's a middle plastic bit. Is yeah, that the what plastic it is? Bit okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so the uh, the reel, the spool, the bobbin <laughs> is the histone, the DNA is the thread, and the histone and the DNA together are chromatin. Okay. It's called a complex of DNA and histones. And then your whole genome, all the DNA in your body, is wrapped around multiple uh, histone proteins. So, you get like a sort of string of these bobbins wrapped around, uh, the thread wrapped around the bobbins create this big long string like pearls on a necklace so is there one histone per cell or are there many histones many 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 right okay and then dna wraps around many many and then when you so you have a string of pearls in each cell exactly oh, that bit, right, okay. and pearls, then yes. if you bring all of those uh bobbins and string together into one structure that is what's called a chromosome and i'm pretty sure chromosome i think is quite a well-known yes. word right yeah, yeah, well, yeah, i can yeah. think of anal beads i was just anal about beads. to say that <laughs> what <laughs> That's so just a, a common a common occurrence in your life anyway. I know, <laughs> we're being all nice and ladylike with our string of pearls. Meanwhile, Curry and no, her dirty it's, little corner no, it's over there. said pearls and I was like, like a pearl, pearl necklace. necklace. Mm-hmm. And, then and then, then you went straight to anal No, because the image I had in my head of uh, of something like that, that there's a string of things inside something. I was like, anal beads. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Curry loves uh, anal ding, beads. Ding, 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 ding. You have about 10 trillion cells in your body. If you stretched it all out end to end, they'd stretch over 744 million miles. You, your DNA would stretch to the moon and back 1,500 times. <gasps> wow. Um, That's a shit load But if, if you went to the sun, your DNA would only reach there and back four times. Ah. Oh, Good astrology. astrology, is it? Good yeah. Astrology. <laughs> no, is that astrology that or that astronomy? Impressive? It's astronomy. 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 Yeah. Astrology. 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 Yeah. Which, yeah, it's, and if you did, did that when stretch. Mars was waning, you'd be in a bad mood. Yeah. <laughs> and then you just stroke your it's crystals. It's kind of back to getting back to crystals, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? We were talking about the energy. <laughs> like that. So the key thing, if your DNA is wrapped around a histone, so it's wrapped around and then in parts it's not wrapped around, and then it wraps around again. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. And those bits that aren't wrapped around the histones, they're more accessible and could be expressed more. So that's way. the bit of the anal bead that hangs out so you can pull them out safely. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so any genes that are on that bit are going to be expressed more than the genes that what are wrapped What do you mean by expressed? So yeah, so sure. your yeah. genes encode the information to produce proteins. Mm-hmm. They do that by an intermediate called RNA. So the more RNA they produce, the more they're being expressed and the more protein ends up being produced. So and then what does protein do? Protein does all the functions that your cell needs to do. Your proteins are like the tools of your cell. They use it to do all the jobs that a cell needs to do. Um, so yeah, the more protein uh, you get produced from a gene, the more that gene is being expressed. Um, so it's if like ge- having a dimmer switch on a on a light bulb, kind yeah. of, right? So like the more you turn it on, mm-hmm. then the brighter the light becomes. Okay. So it's sending more, like, so the more you turn it on, it's producing more electricity or whatever, or it's like, it's like more protein. producing more current, or yeah, protein, and then the light becomes brighter. Sure. Yeah. And then the cell works harder. Got so it. bits of DNA that are wrapped around the histones are less accessible for being expressed, so they produce less protein than the bits that are in between. Sure. So what chromatin remodelers do, sort of 
fighting to get into what I actually work on. They alter the bits of DNA that are being associated with histones. So they sort of may slide the reel up and down the thread okay. so that different bits are being wrapped around yes. and different bits are being exposed. So they can change the expression of genes by altering the uh, histones rather than actually interacting with the DNA itself. Right. So therefore you've got this non-DNA based way of changing gene expression, which is why it's epigenetics. Right. What does the epi bit actually mean? I think it means like to the side of or something, oh, okay. something like that. Other epi words. Epidemic. Epidemic. Oh, upon. Upon, upon, yeah. Upon. So it's, yeah, it's upon yeah, the DNA. Upon genetics. Right. So these chromatin remodelers, there's tons of them expressed in your body and your cells, and they all do have individual functions. And we're trying to look at ones that directly impact the growth of your brain. So they're really important, these chromatin remodelers. So a key point of biology is that every cell in your body has the exact same genes, but different cells require different genes to be switched on at the same time. Um, so these chromatin remodelers are really important for making sure only the right genes are switched on in the right cells. So we look at we look at the ones that can impact neural, like your brain growth and growth of your neurons, things okay. like that. So specifically coming onto my project, I look at a gene called CHD8, which is a chromatin remodeler. It has been shown that humans who have mutations in CHD8, so they've lost the function of their CHD8, have a really high risk of um, being diagnosed with autism. I think it's about like a ninety percent chance. Okay, which is way way higher than most risk factors for autism so autism quite a complicated disease to study because it's got loads and loads of risk factors associated with it but not many of them actually have that great an impact on its risk so it's sort of an accumulation of lots mm -hmm. and lots of risk factors that give you sure. the disease but this is one that's a very this strong one has a really strong effect and what that does is it makes it really easy to model in an animal because okay. we all we need to do is go in and change this one gene and we can potentially Cause that animal. To Cause have animal How does autism. an autistic mouse behave? Well, this so yeah, this is what we've done. We've <clears> gone <throat> in and we've changed this gene in a mouse and given it autism. We say there's big controversy in the field of what actually defines an autistic mouse, but we've done a lot of behaviour on our mouse. And the sort of tests you do is you look at uh, social interaction. In my head, this is so freaking cute. Like, yeah. you have this really aggressive mouse Aww. that's really angry, but this mouse is still plodding towards it, like, hello. <laughs> so it just doesn't know that it's yeah. angry. So yeah. what, one quick, so I don't know. In my head, obviously, everybody, that, whoever is going to, is born with autism, right? Or, or, or are there situations where people can become autistic, like in the middle of their life because something happened? So get a clinical diagnosis of autism. It needs to occur in a specific developmental time frame. I think it's like after two years old, you should uh -huh. be diagnosed with autism. But there are envi environmental risk factors for it. Right. But again, not many of them are very strong. And would they have to be in early life? Yeah. So one of the big, the biggest environmental factor, I think, is if your mum has an infection while she's pregnant with you, that the inflammation that she's having can transfer to the fetus and uh -huh. so get, did, increase the risk of autism. Did you take an adult mouse and change it to make it autistic, or did you? No. Was it was it a fetus of a mouse? No. And then so it what, developmentally had it. What we have is we have like we've generated a colony of mice that have a mutation. So what you do to create sort of just any sort of transgenic mouse is you take the stem cells of a mice you take them out of a developing egg take stem cells out introduce the mutation into the stem cells right in a dish in a dish put those mutated stem cells back into a pregnant mouse into her right. into yes. her fertilized egg and then she'll give birth to genetically modified mice yes and you can then breed those mice and any mice that come from those mice will also be genetically modified so they'll, they'll all have the same mutation. I suppose well, I'm kind of going down the, the rabbit hole a little bit then. Is there a guarantee that those genetically edited or changed mice will definitely produce autistic mice? They should. So it depends on... So every gene in your body you have two copies of. Because yes. you have a copy from your mum, a copy from your dad. Yes. So if they have one copy that's mutated, they can have babies that are either normal or mutated. Yes. If they have two copies that are mutated, all their... But yeah, so it just depends whether you keep it. That's called either being homozygous or heterozygous. So it yes. depends what you, how you keep it. Um, Alistair Mulder and I just pulled very impressed faces at your question. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very good question. Oh yeah, we, we were did, all, yeah. all three of us were just doing the like. Mm. Doing like oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you were asking about what defines an autistic mouse? Yeah. So the 
two key sort of clinical symptoms of autism are poor social communication and repetitive behaviours. So the way we assess that in our mice is we do what's called a social interaction test. So you put them in like a free chambered box. One chamber has another mouse in that they've never met before. The other has a just sort of like a novel object but that's like tends to be like a toy or something. But that, again, that they've never seen. The idea is a regular mouse would want to spend more time with another mouse. So you sort of time the amount of time they spend interacting with the different objects. And in an autistic mouse, you would ideally see a reduction in the time they spend with the other mouse. I don't know this, but are mice social animals in the first place? Very, uh, they are? yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cute. Um, and And um, that's why the uh, country, the uh, country mouse and the city mouse became friends. <laughs> Does anyone remember that? I'm definitely cutting that story out. Or a... It was an old book about a country mouse and a city mouse. No. But the repetitive behaviours test is, <laughs> is uh, even cuter. So what you do is you put a load. So they're kept in uh, cages with like lots of sawdust. Uh, you put in a load of marbles, and the idea is that uh, a repetitive mouse is going to do a lot, of, a lot of digging. So the more digging they do, the more autistic like they do. So the more marbles that end up getting buried, that's like a measure of how repetitive they're oh. being. So that's a nice little test. That's so cute. Yeah. That is that quite cute. One. But if I was that mouse, I'd be pissed once some huge human comes in and takes yeah. away all my marbles. Yeah. So that's undoing all my hard work of digging. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You're a terrible person. <laughs> yeah. What I... So, that, so there's guys in our lab who do all that behaviour stuff, but what I actually do is what's called electrophysiology so i record this has come up before and Achilles <laughs> talked about it and she's afraid that i <laughs> ridiculed her description of it but i really didn't yeah that is recording the function of neurons so looking at the electrical activity of neurons sure so idea in the autism field is that it's caused by an imbalance in the amount of excitatory and inhibitory function in your brain so explain again yeah I was, I was going to. <laughs> in your brain you have broadly two different types of neurons you have excitatory neurons that excite other neurons pass on their message and get yeah. other neurons to yeah, fire yeah, yeah. Pew, pew. and then you have inhibitory neurons whose idea <laughs> whose function is to sort of regulate that amount of firing and stop it getting too much because if you have too much firing, that's what leads to things like epileptic seizures. It's like an over overactivity of your brain. Sure. Okay. And the idea in autism in general is that um, the balance between the two is off, and you get a slightly odd in, level. In which way? Unknown. It depends what ah, paper you read. Okay. Some oh. see more inhibitory, some see more excitatory. And is it in a particular part of the brain, or is it various yeah. parts of the brain? Yeah. So it or... mainly the big area that's been. Uh, implicated is the prefrontal cortex so the front of your brain which and the cortex is the region that does all your sort of higher order thinking so things like emotions social interaction social, yeah, are okay. all computed in that region of the brain it does so many things it controls your movement and stuff as well but it's so saying the cortex is implicated is a bit like i don't know saying if, your if you body can, is implicated in health yeah yeah <laughs> exactly yeah food is the Very problem in your diet yeah. Yeah. yeah what we're trying to achieve with this mouse is we've got a gene that's easy to knock out so we can model autism quite easily in a mouse yep. and then we're trying to see what changes that causes in the brain and whether we can apply those changes broadly to autism to see if we can find sort of sort of general mechanisms that are going wrong in the brains of these patients so what i do okay. is i go in and uh, record the amount of excitatory function and inhibitory function in the brains of these mice and see if it's different from wild type mice Right. Wild type time. being normal. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, wild type say, so there's some sort of control then, I'm guessing. Yes. So, like, so we were talking before about how a heterozygote mutant mouse can have normal babies. Yes. So I compare the babies of a mutant parent mated with a normal mouse. So they'll have half mutant babies, half normal babies, and I compare the two. So it's all quite tightly controlled. So they're brothers and sisters. Yeah. Cute, but some of them are autistic and some of them are not. <laughs> so like in real life yeah yeah so yeah. i've got another question maybe it's slightly sort of tangential but um we love tangents back, in here yeah back tangential. to the, the sort of yeah i know that was that was a buzzword wasn't it that's a could, fantastic word, word. Um, <laughs> i've never heard that word in my life <laughs> um so you were saying the fact of okay yeah you were talking about the the the, the control or the the wild was it wild type wild type mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's what you said. yeah. That's how so i suppose it's kind of coming on to like 
confounding factors and things like that. Like surely, because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about when you go and see an animal in the zoo. They do repetitive stuff, like they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forward, and also if they get depressed or things like that, they might become less sociable. How do you normalize for things like that? So the way you do, you just have to treat every animal exactly the same, other than it's sure. gene, then it's genes. Then you would see and a difference then, between them. Like, yeah, so then you assume that the only difference is because of the genes you see. So yeah. they're all ha- the housed together in the same conditions. They have the same parents. So you assume there's no sort of rearing Other differences genes. between the mm. two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the as important, long as you like, see enough of them. The important thing: there's lots of different wild type mice. So um, there's lots of different strains of mice that different labs use that all have slight variants in their behaviours so one of the other commonly used autism mouse is just a, a wild type mouse that was inbred over so many generations they'd started developing repetitive behaviours oh. which is called a BTBR if anyone's interested and that's your model mouse for idiopathic autism so autism that's caught, that has no known cause they model that with this BTBR mouse just because it happens to be a bit antisocial oh that's interesting because it was inbred yeah, but I mean, all mouse are inbred as well, to be, to yeah. be fair. Like, and that one wouldn't particularly have this genetic mutation? No. So no like one, no one knows lots why... Lots and lots of those little... Conf- yeah, that's exactly what they think. Contributing factors. Yeah. So no one knows why this mouse has these social deficits, but right. they found that it did, so they're like, oh, let's use that as an autism model. Um, I have two things on autism. I feel like, Kerry, you're really enjoying being on the other side of the, of the science. I am. It's, quite, it's podcast. quite fun. <laughs> I have like I've heard two theories of autism that I quite mm. like. One I really like, but I'll do the second. The first one is that every single human is actually autistic. It's on an autistic scale. Yeah. Um, but scientists tend to be quite a lot higher up than on the scale than non-scientists. Is this true? Are we all autistic in here? I apart would, from I would say I would say there's when people say there's the spectrum not everyone is on the spectrum to be on the spectrum you need to have that diagnosis of repetitive behaviors and um social interaction so you can't have ah. someone that's not autistic on a spectrum like is there a we're all on the spectrum man <laughs> see that's what i thought yeah. but no no I'm like wrong. no so the way the reason they call it a spectrum is because the the severity of symptoms in uh-huh. individual autism patients varies wildly so there's a mm-hmm. spectrum within autism okay. but you're not that doesn't mean that everyone is on the spectrum. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I really like this theory, mm. but um, I was heard from some scientists people that uh, some people think that autism might actually be the next stage of evolution. I've heard this as well. Where, yeah. Because a lot of autistic kids have those super memory powers and super math skills and all that kind mm. of shit, um, that maybe actually autism isn't a developmental disorder. It's the next stage of evolution. So what you're referring to there is what's called savants. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. These, yeah, these yeah, autistic yeah. people with... Um, like mad skills. Real life well, mad skills, I think they're called. Isn't isn't <laughs> but, <laughs> but, scientifically yeah. known as mad skills? <laughs> but I think the, the the prevalence of those sorts of people is being really exaggerated by the media. Because you see, you see, they come up a lot. Oh no! They, they I are, succumbed. They I are, succumbed to the media. <laughs> <laughs> they are really interesting, but I think I, I, maybe fact checking to Bowser can look this up. But I think the percent the percentage of autistic people that have savant skills are, is like less than one percent pretty fucking is cool it, though i feel like there's different levels of that too though right like i feel like a savant usually is someone that has really like crazy like specialization and things they'll have like synesthesia and things like that that's the where your senses on you can start to taste numbers and like feel music and things like yeah. that as opposed to someone that is sorry, maybe yeah. just like very detail orientated on and good with numbers or something like ding, that. Ding, yeah ding. i'm not I'm sorry silent demands a fact uh, the estimated prevalence of savant abilities in autism is 10 percent. so that's actually oh, quite high, okay, that's that's, high yeah. um, whereas the prevalence in a non-autistic population including those of mental retardation is less than one percent Mm. Okay, fair enough. So ten percent from an autistic population is quite high. But then, what is defined defined as a savant? Like that, that's what I'm trying to say. Is it someone that ha- that can recite pi to twenty five de- twenty five thousand like, decimal yeah, places, yeah. or is it someone that is like ten percent better at math? And than... I think I think it feeds into this repetitive behaviors side of autism is that they become fixated on one thing and they become extremely good at that one thing. Yeah, yeah. If you put them out of their area, then they're not as comfortable. So it's 
So it's almost like they're not, they might not necessarily have better aptitude towards it. It's because of the nature of being so repetitive in one thing that they actually just get very good at it. Partly, yeah. But then equally, I think some of the ma- the most major breakthroughs you're going to make are only from people who become obsessed with something. So it's, yeah. it's, maybe yeah. we put too much of an emphasis mm, yeah. on trying to be good at many we things. We have more silent demands yep. effects. Um, so people working in science and engineering are more likely to have autistic traits than less technical professions. Um and it, that this question, this survey thing that they did with the public also confirmed that men tend to be more autistic than women. And the questionnaire, which is called the Autistic Spectrum Quotient, was developed by at Cambridge Uni, led by a guy called Professor Simon Baron Cohen, who is, is such oh, a yeah. Baron Cohen's dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. How wow, freaking cool! Yeah. He's a big name in the field. Yeah, Stop. I, knew that. I never knew that. Is it his dad or is it his uncle or something? Oh, his no. uncle, his cousin. Was it? Cousin. Oh, it's his cousin. Oh, Does really? He... I thought I remember reading that his dad was a, like a professor at Oxford or something like Cambridge. that. Cambridge. His cousin very, is also... Very well-educated family, I think. Okay, so it's, it's someone I else. I mean, Sasha Baron family. Cohen is smart. Mm, very yeah, 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 yeah. Just chose a different path. Yeah, used his genius in a different way. I think it's Curry, gone. any questions about electrophysiology? No. You get off your chest? I don't care no. about electrophys. Oh. <laughs> sort of neuroscientist to you <laughs> <laughs> electrophys is cool I just, electrophys is hard though I don't really understand electrophys you, you need to I had to go when I first started I knew nothing about electronics so I had to go back to GCSE bite size to remind myself what like, voltage oh, and current that. was yeah. <laughs> that's the position I started from so you can get good I think quickly. it's every part of biology that overlaps a lot with physics mm. i'm a bit like nope i'm out yeah, <laughs> yeah me too can i ask a bit about it i know that you talked spoken about it in previous podcasts well, apparently I, I, it was all inaccurate information so ask all you want i did not i've never <laughs> said this <laughs> correct, correct all the information theories are like given there you didn't go into that much detail no, you i don't think you ever said anything wrong you didn't like how i said we stab the cell oh yeah true yeah, yeah. it's yeah it's difficult so yeah curry was talking about a specific specific type of ethers which is called patch clamping which is actually what i do which is um putting an electrode on a neuron so what i do is i dissect out the brain of a mouse slice it into sort of thin sections have them in under a microscope and then you have electrode coming down which is like a glass pipette with a wire inside and you fill that pipette with the same sort of stuff that's inside a cell right and then the very t- the tip of the pipette is like really 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 small, but it's hollow and round. Put that onto the surface of your cell, and then you just sort of like suck. For yourself. The... Yeah. <gasps> what? What? It's linked. It's sort no, of... you don't. You do. So it's linked. Fires. This is barbaric. Very precise. <laughs> it's linked through like some tubing to this like little suction thing you have here, and you just. What if you suck up the cell? You have to be gentle. No, no, I don't. Oh my god, I would eat so many mouse brains if I had to do no. this. What the fuck? <laughs> There's a lot in between you and you're not going to like inhale the cell. And the, the tip is like, if that's the. Oh, again, visual cues, but it, like the cell's like 100 micrometers big. And your pipette tip's like 5 micrometers big, so it's not going to fit. Okay. Uh, but you just touch it to the surface and you just go like that. And it seals the surface of the cell. I can't believe this. I this never knew prepared. you actually like sucked on it. And it breaks the Surely surface. Surely not. It breaks the s- surface of the cell, so it's now like essentially your wire is inside because right. you've got full co- full uh, like connection between the inside of the cell. Are you right, really right. telling me, as far as technology has come, they haven't they found this cells. way? Yeah, it's to the best give way. The, give the, the most perfect cells. amount of suction onto this pipette. It's the most controllable. Some people there's a zap function on most. Amplifiers, it's meant to do the same thing, but it's no, it's not as good. Oh, it's so you don't? You, well, have you ever more. sucked it up the pipette? When I was first learning, yeah. I don't know <laughs> <I was doing. laughs> what but does that like, feel like? You know, it doesn't feel like. Does it go you, in your you, mouth? You, you can only tell from the like you have a readout of like the electrical activity, and you can tell when it's just gone, fucked. Like oh. it, it, when it's essentially in your. There's a lot of stuff in between it. the thing that you're sucking on and the actual tip oh, of the okay. pipette, so it would have to go. Like through a lot of things to make it to your mouth. Yeah. So uh, I wouldn't worry about okay. that. Okay. So there's filters. Yeah. I've seen an electrophys set up once in real life, and it was really depressing. Why? Like it was just this really dingy room. Yeah. With this machine, and I just thought, and everyone was on their own doing it, and I was like, if if this was my, I think I'd be quite depressed. I quite like it because I, <laughs> I can just put put a podcast on and just chill. Uh, just a podcast get, like yeah. a yeah, layout, layout podcast, <laughs> and um, yeah, you get in like a zen state where you're just like patch a cell, just do, you and do yourself. what you need, and then so, so the next one. So then, once you have sucked the appropriate amount, yeah, and, and you have it there, yeah, what then happens? How technical would you like me to get? You do a thing called voltage clamp. So what you, your electrode is linked up to an amplifier, which can inject current into your cell and also record current from your electrode. 
So what you do is you set a voltage that you'd like to clamp your cell at. So your amplifier records the voltage of the cell, sees how different it is from the one you want to clamp it at, and then injects the amount of current to bring it to that voltage and then holds it there that way. And then any sort of activity that the cell undergoes that's going to change its voltage will then change the amount of current that your amplifier is having to inject into the cell. Sure. So then you just get a readout of how much current the amplifier is injecting, and that tells you what currents are going in and out of that cell. Cool. So it does it that way. So it's, it's a bit of an indirect measure, but it tells you what you need to know. Cool. Should mm. we move on to your paper? Do you want to? Yeah. So this isn't really to do with the brain, but it is to do with chromatin remodeling, which, as we remember earlier, is mm -hmm. when you change the interaction between histones and DNA to change genetic expression. So one of the things that uh, impacts how histones interact with the DNA is whether they're methylated or not. So okay. they have these little additions, these methyl groups, and that changes their interaction. So what these this paper did, they changed the uh, histone methylation inside the sperm of mice and then saw what impact that had on the offspring of the male mice that had this modification. And what they found is that it caused like really bad developmental defects as these mice got these mice got older. So they've called it disruption of histone methylation in developing sperm impairs offspring health transgenerationally. Mm. It's not too bad of a title. It's I think not. it sums it up mm. quite well. Transgenerational, as in it doesn't do anything to the mice whose sperm are changed. Yes. Their exactly. offspring. <laughs> yes. So what? Transgenerally, like you were born in one generation and you think that you actually belong in another. <laughs> you transcend generations. I think I'm quite transgenerous. Yeah, I think, I think maybe Rob is. One of the really interesting findings that I'll come on to is that they actually found if your dad had this mutation that caused this altered histone methylation, but you didn't inherit that gene which caused it, mm -hmm. your children could also have these developmental defects. Oh. So, the, so the idea is that things go, going wrong in your granddad could mm -hmm. affect your development as well. Oh, okay. oh. So, oh. Shit. I'll go into how they came to that. Is uh, that like conclusion. the way they say certain things skip generations? Like, you know, the way apparently twins. Um, Not in the same way. Okay. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a satisfying answer. <laughs> So, do I, should I crack on? Yes, crack on. The, the reason they did this, birth defects is what is essentially the field that this lab is in. And they noticed that in the, in the sort of public knowledge, people tend to put the emphasis on preventing birth defects on the mum. So when the mum's pregnant, she shouldn't drink alcohol, she shouldn't smoke, all that sort of thing. Yes, yes, yes. And they were like, hang on. What, if, what are the dads doing wrong? So they were trying to see what impact... That's right. Yeah. What yeah. impact doing doing the wrong. health of your sperm... <laughs> Can't build car parts properly. Could. I'm fucking up the yeah, sperm. exactly. <laughs> so they were trying to see what impact, like, the health of your of the father's epigenome could have on, on the development of the offspring. So what they did is they overexpressed a gene called KDM1A, which encodes a chromatin remodeler, similar to... Um, the CHD8 that I was talking about earlier that I work on. They made it active only in the sperm of the male mice. So therefore, the sperm of these male mice had far too much of this KDM1A uh, chromatin remodelers. Did they have autistic sperm? <laughs> different different genes. <laughs> <as well. laughs> we moved away from autism. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> We're um, birth defects. <laughs> yeah. So the... The function of KDM1A is to demethylate histones, so it takes off these methyl right, groups okay. from the histones, so it's changing the interaction of the histones with the with the DNA. So therefore, if you overexpress it, way more methyl groups are being removed than should be, so you're screwing up the epigenetics of the sperm of these mm -hmm. mice. And they then... Um, it's good that we talked about this earlier, actually. So the, so the male mice were heterozygous for that for that uh, gene, so they only had one copy. Yep. So therefore, in their offspring could also have the gene, or they could be normal. Mm -hmm. And then they traced the impact of that gene over multiple generations and saw what happened to, to the mice as they got more and more exposed to that gene. First thing they did is determine that expression of this, uh, this gene didn't actually affect the sperm in any way. It didn't screw up the male's testicles. They found that their testicular size was normal. Good for them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and spermatogenesis... Uh, was fine and it didn't damage the DNA or the genome. Spermatogenesis being the production of the sperm. sperm. Production sperm. of sperm, yeah. sorry, yep. 
and it did not damage the DNA of the sperm, so it was only acting on the at the epi, epigenetic level. So then what they did is they started assessing the survivability of the offspring of these mice. Is that a word? Survivability, so how well they survive. No, I, I understood what it meant. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's it, a it word. is a word. <laughs> yeah. Probabilizing. <laughs> Same. So what they found is they compared how well the babies of these mice that have these male mice that have the transgene uh, survive compared to mice with normal dads who don't have this mutation, and they found that it was significantly reduced. And if they had a baby of a dad who also had this mutation, they assessed his that mouse's babies as well, and they found that as you went down the generations, survivability got worse and worse and worse. So is that are... like stillbirth or actually like born alive and then died very quickly? Or... So what they did is they traced, um, so they would just literally record how many mice were still alive every day for 22 days. After oh, okay, so after birth. So in a normal mouse, they had about 90% of the babies would survive until um, 22 days. After two generations of exposure to this transgene, by 22 days, you only had about 60% surviving. Okay. Uh -huh. And by three generations, it was around 30%. Oh, wow. Oh. So the idea is, is the more each generation you get more exposure to this gene, your epigenome is getting more and more screwed up and it's getting worse and worse. Your third generation is like great great grandkids. Yes. So that's not unexpected because mm. we know like each time you get exposed to this, it's going to screw up your genome a bit more. So you're going to get more worse and worse defects and survivability is going to go down. But what was. What I think is the coolest finding in this paper. So we talked about how it was heterozygous, so you could have normal babies being born and um, mutant babies being born. What they also found is the offspring of a mutant dad, but who didn't have this mutation, mm -hmm. their offspring would also have reduced survivability. Oh. So this is this is someone whose granddad had the mutation, yeah, whose dad didn't, uh -huh. and they don't either. Right. But their survivability was down to about seventy-five percent. So significantly different uh, from. from did, the they, did they figure out why? Because it wasn't even though it wasn't impacting them. That's what they try and go through later on in the paper. We'll come to that. But the the the, the true <laughs> the true answer is no, not really. But they suggest they okay. suggest some um, ideas. Just apologise, anyone who hates mouths. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Did I slur? For the slur. Yeah. Um. And it was the way you tried to get in so quickly <laughs> really for your next word. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, so they so they've seen these uh, this reduced survivability in these mice, but they'd also noticed just from like sort of looking at them day to day that they also sort of showed these abnormal growth defects. So they wanted to assess that in a bit more detail. And what they also suspected is that unfortunately, mummy mice are a bit mean, oh. and if they have any sort of oh, oh, yeah. they eat them defective yeah. oh. children, they'll eat the defective oh. children. Well, so I they mean, thought you know. they could be underestimating like, the severity, like, severity of these effects. Are there other mums mean, or are they just saving their children from a lifetime of? I mean, out in the wild, I can see That's perfectly the why they do it. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah, about it's about wrong. to get a bit more graphic. I apologise for this. Okay, so what well, they, we'll put the disclaimer in now. Yeah. So what? <laughs> what they did now? They were worried that they maybe were underestimating the severity of these defects. So they didn't let the mother give birth to the babies. They would dissect the babies out when they were pretty much Ooh. ready to be born, right. but she didn't have a chance to give birth oh, and eat any that were, put... were grim. Yeah. <laughs> so a mouse is a mouse's pregnancy is normally twenty days old. When the embryos were eighteen and a half days old, they dissected them out and sort of looked at the lump for any sort of gross abnormal development question yes did they die yes so they didn't they didn't live at all no okay no they and mice don't actually feel anything until like pee until they're like three days old i think okay so yeah they'd be and all this all i should state all this was done in accordance with the ethical guidelines of the animal act 1986 so for this they assessed the number the amount of pregnancy loss in females and the proportion of embryos and fetuses that were abnormally developed and what they found is that the transgenic fathers had more litters that were lost so more pregnancy loss compared to the wild types and also a severely increased uh, number of fetuses that had some sort of developmental defect so in wild type mice it was less than five percent but in these transgenic mice with the mutation it went up to about 25%. Oh. Mm. And e with the ones that were, like we talked about, whose granddads would had this mutation, but they didn't, 
their litters would be about 10% uh, genetically. And w- would, mm. there, would there be, I'm guessing it's probably quite a sort of complex knock-on effect of what could actually happen, but yeah. it, would there be any like particular deformity that would actually be found that would be the thing that would be the cause of death or not? So it was really wide ranging. So they were a bit kind of not, not sneaky is not the right word, but what, they essentially hedged their bets really well with this with the gene they chose, this KDM one A. Its function is to regulate genes that are vital for development. So like the very oh, okay. basic core things that set your body up in the right way. It controls those genes. So by impacting that expression, you're going to have really wide ranging Fine. effects on development. So the sort of things they would report were. Skeletal abnormalities, so their limbs wouldn't develop properly. Blunted nose, their face and skull wouldn't develop properly. And things called like hemorrhagic foci, so this is where like your blood vessels are not attached to Formed. each other, and yeah. they're just sort of spitting up blood into. Wow. Well, oh god. Okay. It's not nice. <laughs> okay. It's like making vampire babies. Yeah. yeah. No, this is like real, like like sort of evil scientist type stuff here. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's, uh, yeah. It's not the nicest paper, but it's interesting i think maybe uh, maybe that reflects badly on me <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the key is really badly deformed babies in the ones with the transgene but also the ones whose granddad had the transgene they were also siring pups with these uh, defects and then the final thing they did just because they'd noticed that these skeletal abnormalities were happening they did a much more in-depth look at the ossification so the formation of bones Right. And these mice, so they did a stain. So that, Ossification, that's yeah. a nice word. So they, uh, you can do that. There's a commonly used stain which stains bone red and cartilage blue. And they just compared a normal mouse to these the pups of these uh, mutated mice and found that they weren't really forming bone properly, hmm. which sort of explains the um, abnormalities they were seeing. But they do, they do state, and I agree with them, that they probably underestimate the amount of things that are wrong with these mice because it's like impossible to do the number of experiments that you would need to do to find yeah, everything sure. that was wrong with them. And it's pointless, really. Like The, the take-home message is they're really screwed up, and it's because of this transgene that they caught and the alteration of the histone methylation. So now they wanted to move on to why is this happening? Like, What is the actual mechanism? So their initial suspicion was like this gene that we're overexpressing, this KDM1A, its function is to take off methyl groups from histones. So why don't we just look at the amount of histone methylation that's going on? And what they did is they compared normal mice with the transgenic mice, so these mice that had the KDM1A in their sperm. And I, I should say they did this all in the sperm. So they took the sperm out from the mice and looked at the histones within the sperm. And, and then, then did they put the sperm back in? No. So they would just sort of they take they take the DNA out of the sperm and look at the DNA of the sperm, and um, then also these mice whose granddad had had the gene but they themselves didn't. Yeah. And they compared between the three, and what they found was that as you would expect, the ones that had this KDM1A overexpressed had much reduced uh, methylation. But what was surprising, as they were as they still had the defects, the non-transgenic mice didn't show any difference to wild type mice, so these normal mice. So they were a bit like, hmm, we thought that was what was causing it, but that isn't any different, so it can't be, it oh, can't right, be okay. the methylation. So then I imagine they scratched their heads and were like, okay, what are we going to look at now? <laughs> and then a good chunk of this paper is just sort of failed attempts to try and find things that were wrong <laughs> in the <laughs> non-transgenic <laughs> mice, yeah. which, um, negative results. which are negative results. So I won't bore you with those, but they tried a few things. But what they eventually did find something that was different so what they eventually looked at was the amount of RNA that was in the sperm. So we talked about RNA earlier, which is the amount of expression that genes have, is the amount of RNA that they're producing. And what they found is that both the transgenic and the non-transgenic mice had reduced amounts of RNA in their sperm. Mm. And crucially, it was pretty much exactly the same genes that were being reduced between the two. So you're like, ah... Same thing's happening in the two. This is probably what's causing uh, the defects. Right. So what they're proposing is happening is that you screw up the methylation of the DNA, of the histones. That's altering the genetic uh, expression of the DNA. Therefore, you're getting this reduced RNA expression in the sperm of these mice. Mm -hmm. And there's another step on from that to determine why the reduced RNA actually causes causes the defects that it causes. So what they did is looked at what the impact of the reduced RNA in the sperm actually has on the offspring. So again, they mated the the mice together and they took the transgenic and the non-transgenic embryos when they were 
just two cells big. And what they found is that this transmission of this altered RNA sperm had a knock-on effect in the embryos of their offspring and changed the expression of genes in the two cells of their Okay, so literally well. from the very beginning then. Yeah, so things are being screwed up immediately upon conception and that's what's giving rise to these to these defects, they suspect. And that's where they end. And fair play to them, they did a lot of work to get to there. But it does leave a lot of questions unanswered, essentially. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? Yeah, like, what's the point? Because I think with a paper like this, it's quite hard to relate it back to... Um, us. Yeah, real world. Real right? life. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the big, the big conclusion of this, and like, I assume what the press would take from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the big thing about your epigenome, so your epigenetics, is that they can be affected by the environment. Mm-hmm. So things like smoking, taking drugs, um, amount of exercise you get, stress have all been shown to directly change your epigenome and change your mm-hmm. interaction of histones with your DNA. Whereas your DNA stays the same yeah. largely throughout your life, your epigenetics is constantly changing in, res- in response to your environment. So what they're saying here is that this can have huge effects on the development of your offspring if your epigenome gets really screwed up. Mm-hmm. So their take-home message is, men, look after your sperm because it can, have, <laughs> it can, not, only, it can not only affect you and your children, it can also affect your grandchildren and uh-huh. their grandchildren well, later on down the line. Well, isn't it a good thing line. that uh, we don't have emo boys walking around with super, super tight skinny jeans anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The point I want to raise against that is what they've done here is really severe. So overexpression of this gene like really, really, really screws up your epigenetics. Mm-hmm. Um to a degree that environmental stresses would not. Exactly. So the, the question that I, I, and to be fair, they raised the point as well, is like it's still unproven whether any sort of natural stimulus could influence your epigenome to the extent that their one did. Yeah. But I mean, so what, that was kind of, I had a question on that. Yeah, there's the level of severity to influence something to happen like that. But do we, do we even have an idea of what environmental stimulus could cause this to happen yeah so there's like there's a paper on pretty much anything you want to really? talk about so like smoke <laughs> people have shown smoking can change your epigenetics uh, stress can change your epigenetics the amount of exercise but, but in get. this particular way no so i don't think anyone would be able to pin it down to like a an individual gene check so when you're doing this experiment the way you quantify it is you look at like the level of histomethylation so yeah and you would make someone do a load of exercise, make someone not do any exercise, and you would compare the histomethylation between the two, and they would probably be different. But you would have no idea what caused the difference. You would just know exercise was the changing factor, but you don't know what the cascade of things that happened after that to result in that altered methylation would be. So you couldn't pin it down to like an individual gene like they have done here. And in all likelihood, it wouldn't be as severe a change as we've seen here. So... Okay, but from running the mill things that you're talking about, like like your fitness level, your smoking, your drinking, your drug taking, like that would be something you would see de- de- meth- demethylation of. It could be demethylation. It could be more methylation. It okay, could so it could, be, but it could impact it. That's they, they, they all impact it, and there's so many things that are considered epigenetic changes that it, uh, you can find anything. Yeah, that it's changing because like there's enough. so many things to look at. <laughs> yeah, this is like the whole thing of like everything gives you cancer. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like, a bit like that. Right, yeah. But I think it's still a it's still a science. It's in a bit of it's a bit of an infancy. Okay. So mm-hmm. we're still getting to grips with what all these changes actually mean and how they mm-hmm. and how they interact with one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just it's so complicated that it's hard to make definitive statements like about what causes. Yeah, what. Mm-hmm. of course, of course. Yeah. And do you think it's like you were saying earlier on that? There's probably in diseases that do happen in humans or what things that lead to like epigenetic changes that lead to negative consequences in humans. It's not going to be one thing. It's going to be a few. Yeah, almost definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like similar to autism, it's going to be like an accumulation of multiple small risk factors that eventually lead to big effects rather than like one big change. Yeah. I'm having a mini crisis. So it's not like one. <laughs> no, it's not like 